Ready? Okay, so uh, next talk is going to be remote. So I will just here, like, stand here to uh, change the slides. Uh, it's about the PTP profile, which uh, basically, uh, when it comes to PTP and profile, is basically a set of standards, set of uh, options that you can take. Uh, and uh, when we started uh, TAP, there was no uh, profile, PTP profile, like tailored for data centers. So uh, Michelle from Meta and uh, Thomas from uh, NVIDIA, they worked, uh, plus a lot of uh, other people here, but you see these two names, like uh, they were leading the effort on uh, various, uh, let's say a document. The outcome of this was a document that basically explains various options that you can take uh, and tailor it uh, to your needs and also explains like um, what you shouldn't do perhaps. So with no further ado, let's uh, get it started. So do we have uh, Michelle or Thomas online? Yes, I am at, yeah. Um, hey, Michelle. Thank you. Okay, so let's do it, Michelle. All right, uh, very good. Um, if we can go to the slide, uh, please. Yeah, we are at the agenda slide. Okay, super. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ahmad. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> my name is uh, Michelle uh, from uh, Meta. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Thomas, to basically give you a quick, uh, short walkthrough of the, um, the first PTP profile uh, for the data center industry or community that you know, we've been working on within OCP TAP in the past year. We've made a lot of great progress, um, and this is what we want to share uh, you know, uh, with all of you. Um, a lot of things were mentioned in the previous talks. For instance, I heard uh, you know, uh, uh, GNSS, uh, Open Time Server, Time Card, uh, Unicast, reliability, and all of that. And the PTP profile, like Amat was saying in the introduction, is really a, a, no more than a document that basically defines how you put all of this together. Okay, so this is really, a, you know, the, the core of the objective of the PTP profile is to define, you know, how we put all of that together. Uh, could we uh, go to the next slide, uh, please, Aman? So, um, when you look at the work, you know, that is being accomplished within the uh, OCP tab, one of the uh, main objective is to define, you know, very high level, this aspect of a time synchronization service across you know, the infrastructure of the data center to basically improve either a set of uh, current applications or enable you know, a new set of applications. And we'll hear you know, about some of these applications a little bit uh, you know, uh, later this morning. Um, right now, uh, you know, within the OCP tab, we've converged on using the precision timing protocol. You know, with, with a high level objective to provide two to three orders of magnitude better performance, you know, when you compare to, you know, current sure. network timing sure. protocol sure. infrastructure that is used in uh, data centers, uh, you know, uh, today. It, it, essentially, we want to move from, you know, milliseconds, right, which is still, a, a, you know, a small number in terms of time, down to the microse microseconds you know, precision with a fairly high level, you know, uh, amount of uh, reliability. And, you know, to, to realize that, um, we've been working on multiple work streams that were uh, presented uh, uh, previously. Um, and, and one of them relates to the PTP profile specification. And this is what we'll introduce uh, this morning, myself and Thomas. We cannot see the slides. Uh... Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, so. In slide three, se several applications, you know, in the past year have been discussed within the, you know, the, the TAP project group through various presentations, you know, given by community members. You'll find a link there with, you know, all of the recorded uh, talks. Um, very high level, for instance, uh, there were a couple of talks on what we call distributed database uh, systems, where the objective there is to increase the throughput you know, of transactions via the use of better clocks. Um, the second type of application that was discussed is relates to network monitoring, 
which basically the objective there is to um, try and you know uh, measure network events using uh, what we call one-way delay measurements. So if you make your one-way delay measurements more precise, then you know in theory that should you know give you better visibility to what is happening you know with the events you know in the network. Uh, there were a few talks also on 5G where the objective there, um, and this is a well-known you know, use case to provide reliable you know, uh, air, air interface uh, synchronization. And we'll hear a lot more on this subject in the telco uh, uh, stream uh, this afternoon. There are a couple of talks on that uh, specific uh, subjects. Um, next slide, please. So let, let's take a, a very high level example, for instance, to put you know, this into, uh, for instance, context. Let's say you've got an application A uh, that basically issues a write command you know, to a client here called C1. Basically that client, when it receives that request, it chooses a timestamp, let's say T1. That timestamp might be in the future. And then it executes you know, that writes to a set of replicas. When all of this is completed and you know, the write operation has been acknowledged, the same application might, for instance, decide you know, to do a read. But it does so in this example, for instance, through a different client uh, that is called uh, C2. So again, C2 chooses a read timestamp. That timestamp might be, for instance, uh, in the future also. That timestamp is uh, you know, a time T2. And it basically reads you know, the object from, you know, uh, one of the replicas in this example here, just show uh, through uh, R3. So here's basically, you know, a, a bit the dilemma. If this timestamp T2 is greater than T1, then the client C2 is gonna be reading valid data, right? I mean, it might take a bit of time to read the data, right, between the difference between where T2 is in comparison to T1, but if it's in the future, it's going to read, you know, the proper uh, valid data. But if T2, for instance, is smaller than T1, because of things like, uh, you know, a clock skew, the application will basically see um, stale, you know, data. Even though the write, you know, what that was done by client C1, completed before, you know, uh, the, uh, the read operation began. You know, when you look at things, you know, from an ordering or a real-time ordering of operations uh, or transactions. So it, essentially what you want to make sure here in this uh, example is that any committed timestamp is always in the past relative to a reference time. And in some of those database systems, maintaining the ordering of these transactions is very important, but also making sure that you have very, you know, the smallest clock skew possible are basically drivers to increase, you know, the performance of these uh, type of systems. Um, next slide, please, Alain. Yeah, thank you, yeah. So um, there's been, you know, a lot of uh, significant advancement uh, in the distribution of, uh, you know, uh, time and synchronization in the past, you know, certainly in the past decade primarily around things like we've heard this morning, you know, uh, silicon that supports PPP, uh, switches and routers also that supports, you know, that are PPP aware, oscillators, uh, you know, a uh, Linux PPP stack, for instance, test equipment, all of which, you know, uh, support uh, PPP. And, and because of that, multiple industries have adopted PPP as, you know, the protocol or the technology of uh, choice for many use case scenarios. Um, and there's many, you know, uh, PTP networks in operation uh, to demand each of these industries, and we'll go into some details in, in the next slide. Each of these industries has to develop what we call a PTP profile specification, which it essentially defines the capabilities required to support a use case, uh, you know, scenario for their particular uh, industry. So the profile really provides you information on how you implement things how you configure and how you will basically operate the uh, PPP. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So this is basically a, a, you know, a table where today there is about half a dozen 
PPP profiles that exist in the industry today, each having a different, uh, you know, scenario, telecom, mobile, professional, uh, you know, a video, power, and so on. Um, but one in the, in the one industry that, you know, has been missing out, you know, from, uh, you know, uh, from this was the data center. And this is what we did within OCP tab within, you know, the past year, is to basically develop a PPP profile for the purpose of uh, data center applications. Um, the, and this is the last row in that table. The PPP profile is basically a 20, you know, plus page document. It was contributed by um, six different uh, companies and it, re it um, basically goes through and contains various requirements that, for instance, pertain to things like network topology, uh, what is the expected time error performance, what are the type of clocks, for instance, and we've heard that a little bit earlier from the pen this morning, right, whether it's transparent clocks versus boundary clocks, what are the communication mode, uh, the PTP messages, uh, the message rates, uh, unicast communication, and so on. All of that is defined in that document. And that document was released back in September and is available on the uh, OCP uh, contributions uh, webpage uh, for anyone to go and uh, read and digest. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things we needed to, in order to kick off this activity, we needed to come up with a reference model. So very high level, we decomposed the, the problem statement into three layers what we call the time reference layer, which contains you know, your GNSS, your GPS, your rooftop antennas, your open time server, your time cards. Um, and then the second layer is what we call the network fabric layer, which is basically a, a, a large set of switches, you know, or routers, for instance, that are uh, you know, uh, PPP aware. Uh, for example, in the first profile, these are uh, transparent clock uh, cap capable switches. And then the bottom layer is what we call the, uh, the server layer, or where you have a very large set of servers that are also PTP aware through what we call a, a clock that is called the ordinary clock. This is the clock that its responsibility is to recover time and then pass it on you know, to the application. That's where you know, the demarcation between the PTP network and the application uh, resides. Uh, next uh, slide, please. My last uh, slide before I pass it on to Thomas. Aman, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, the second thing that we did, and this is a, you know quite important here, it was to define the time error requirement. Okay, what are we trying to meet here? What is the expected you know our performance? If you look in the right hand uh, you know uh, bottom corner of that slide, you're going to see this number five microsecond. This is what we basically uh, came up with as a requirement. Essentially, that says that if you would pick any servers within a data center and you could measure, for instance, their PTP clock, that the difference between any two of these servers, right, would be within plus or minus five microseconds. Okay, this is the absolute value here, five microseconds, within plus or minus five microseconds. So one way to implement that requirement is to say that um, each PTP clock that exists into, for instance, the servers has to be within plus or minus 2.5 microsecond of a common reference. That common reference being that reference that is at the top of that tree topology here, for instance, GPS or GNSS as an example. So if you take an example, for instance, you take two machines uh, or two servers, you know, one server is minus 2.5 and the other one is plus 2.5. They have a difference in between the two of five microseconds. And vice versa, right? Um, any combination thereof of, you know, these values, as long as it's within 2.5 microsecond of a, a, a common reference will basically satisfy that condition of uh, uh, five microsecond between any two, um, servers. So um, the, um, the PTP profile addresses 
you know, how you put all of that together. It talks a lot about, you know, some of those, you know, requirements, talks a lot about, uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of these uh, building blocks uh, here. And, you know, I, I encourage, you know, all of you to go and download that document and, uh, you know, uh, read it uh, through. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it to uh, Thomas, who will provide uh, more information on some of the details of what's in the PTB profile. Quick reminder, you have uh, less than five minutes left. Okay, thank you, Michel. Um, so I'm going to try and, uh, and speed up time uh, and try and make sure we reverse the clocks since we've only got a bit of time left. So how do we actually achieve uh, the target requirements that, uh, that was mentioned on the previous slide? Well, first of all, we're gonna go through a bit of uh, what goes on in the hardware of, uh, of switches in order to um, provide accurate timestamping. So historically, uh, when the first generations of the uh, PTP standard came out back in 2002, uh, most of the hardware wasn't capable of drawing uh, timestamps. So it was a software model. So software um, timestamping was the way forward at that point in time. But that has a number of drawbacks because in the case of software timestamping, everything is done well, obviously, in software, which means it will, in, it will uh, be um, impacted by uh, system noise uh, from the operating system, uh, latency through the pipeline, scheduling, and everything else. So as you can see, those PTP messages were carried from the interface up through the FI, the MAC, the ASIC, to the operating system where the PTP stack itself would reside. So the PTP stack, the so-called virtual disciplined um, clock, and the timestamping all occurred in uh, user space. With hardware timestamping, uh, we actually went into the opposite direction, which is what we want. We want to be able to timestamp as close as possible to uh, the hardware layer, i.e. the FI, um, so uh, modern implementations will actually do the timestamping itself in the FI, and that's also where we reside the uh, uh, PHC, the PTP hardware clock. Uh, the stack itself, of course, is still running in user space. Uh, but that actually means we are able to have modern implementations that are able to do sub 10, 10 nanoseconds uh, accuracy and resolution in those environments. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the other side of the... Uh, the story is beyond the hardware versus time, um, software timestamp is we have one uh, or one step versus two step clock. And again, for historic, historical reasons, the original implementations uh, were not capable of uh, not only drawing hardware timestamps, but even uh, due to that, we were using a two step mechanism. So since we're doing software implementations, we were using a two step software environment, which meant that when you actually draw a, a sync message, from your, uh, from your source, uh, you were not able to have the accuracy to actually write the, uh, the timestamp in the message itself. So you would send what we call a follow-up message. Now, that was also the case because uh, the message rates, or I should say actually the interface rates, um, the time it was available to encode that timestamp into, um, into the interface at that speed, uh, was not uh, was not compatible with the implementations. These have gone away. I mean, in 2022, we can do hardware timestamping uh, directly at uh, you know uh, 100 gigs and beyond. So this is uh, this problem has moved away. The other thing also with one step is that it guarantees that each message is uh, linked to its own timestamp. What you want to avoid is that the sync message would take one path and the follow-up would take another path. And that could happen if you've got you know, uh, equal uh, cost multipath across multiple links and you actually packet spraying uh, those messages, which means you could have uh, out of order sequences. Next slide. Yeah. So where am I? Uh, no, I think there was a slide in between, no? Yeah, thank you. So um, having said that about uh, the, uh, the one versus the two-step clock, we also have two models that are planned for the uh, data center profile. Right now, the model that Michel was talking about is model one, which exists and uses only transparent clocks. So as we've mentioned, uh, this means that we can, by using the one-step hardware clock, we can avoid uh, spraying. And we're actually using network routing for the uh, failure recovery. So whatever path there is between uh, the OC and the grandmaster through the chain of switches, uh, your IGP will actually be sorting out 
uh, making sure those messages arrive between one end and the other. In the next phase of the development of the data center profile, we're looking at model two, which is currently a suggestion using a boundary clock. And in this case, every single uh, switch device runs a boundary clock. And that boundary clock will ultimately be processing messages hop by hop, uh, since it will be disciplining its own uh, PHC, and it will become the uh, source for the device that is downstream. Um, what we're doing is we're actually comparing the data set that is provided from the PDP announce messages, and the failure mechanisms is using the BMCA, the best master clock algorithm, to decide which path is being used between those devices. Again, um, in earlier implementations of boundary clocks, there were issues related to settling time and uh, oscillation. That has been greatly reduced in modern implementations, but it is uh, not as 100% clean cut as it is with a transparent clock. And this model, you can use one or two step also, which uh, gives you flexibility. And this is our next work item for the data center profile. Uh, Thomas, uh, we have yeah. uh, less than a minute left, so if yeah. we can. I'm, I'm getting as fast as I can. Yeah. So failure mechanism, um, it's the same model as we was talking about before. We've got the IGP. Um, we're carrying it, uh, those messages across the transparent clock and the end node itself will figure out from the data set uh, which grandmaster it wants to use. So it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward and it's dictated by the uh, data set. The next slide, and I'm nearly at the end, uh, we have the data center profile, which gives you a recap, which you can read on screen, uh, of the different attributes that are provided. We know that all devices need to be time aware. We know we can run over uh, different transports. We've got default message rates that define. This is what you have in profiles traditionally. Uh, we're using V6 uh, unicast as the uh, main mechanism here. And uh, we have different levels of accuracy and clock classes that are defined. So we'll go to the last slide. Uh, which is the call to action uh, in the 10 seconds I've got left. So we want or we're looking for people to help us out with the work stream number two to develop the second version of the profile that I mentioned, the boundary clock. We're looking at security aspects. How do we want to uh, add authentication and verification of those PTP messages and the load balancing of the uh, PTP unicast sessions. So uh, please come and uh, join us in this effort and uh, we're looking forward to uh, driving this forward. Thank you, Michelle and Thomas.